He replies to the arch chancellor in these words. What would you have had me do with an assembly which only waited for a favorable opportunity to excite a disturbance in the state? It afforded me no opportunity for enlightening the public and exhibited no other feeling than that of ill will towards me. I recollect besides, added the emperor, that Monsieur Fouché, who was connected with all these men, entertained the same opinion in respect to them. He often spoke to me of the necessity of suppressing the legislative body. He said that its members only came to Paris for the purpose of obtaining certain favors, for which they importuned ministers from morning till night and complained that their wishes were not immediately attended to. When invited to dinner, they were bursting with envy at beholding the opulence of the houses in which they were admitted, and after all, they returned to their departments with the conviction that government plundered in every direction to enrich its favorites. Such was their language in private societies where they were looked upon as oracles on their return from the capital. The emperor added that this opinion of Monsieur Fouché might be relied upon as sincere since he had always professed Republican principles. Nevertheless, the Arch-Chancellor persisted in his opinion. The legislative body had opened its sitting on the 21st of December, and its adjournment was, I believe, decreed on the 1st of January. During this short interval of time, news had been received of the violation of the neutrality of Switzerland and of the entrance of the hostile armies into its territory on their way to invade us. The intelligence was conveyed to Paris with great rapidity by means of commercial couriers from Baal. It is proper, I should state in this place, that at the time of the accumulation of Allied troops in the Briscoe, the Swiss cantons, and from which France had demanded an explanation respecting the conduct they intended to pursue in the event of a passage be demanded by the enemy across the Helvetic territory, had given for a reply the day would cause their neutrality to be respected and had sent a deputation to assure the emperor of the good faith of Switzerland and of her determination not to permit any violation of her territory. This deputation was still in Paris when intelligence was brought of the events that had taken place at Baal. The Allies had in fact given to the Helvetic body the assurance that they would respect the frontiers, but intrigue was at work in that as it was in every other quarter. It had quietly been spreading its nets, and when everything was in readiness, the explosion took place. Switzerland suddenly learned that it was no longer free, but that the coalition, feeling anxious to restore her former independence, was going to oppress her with a million of soldiers. The general who was to cause the territory of the Cantons to be respected found that his efforts would be all in vain. The high allied powers had declared that the neutrality of Switzerland could not be acknowledged under present circumstances, and that the act of mediation was annulled with all its consequences. The object, therefore, for which the federative army had been collected no longer existed. He disbanded his troops and ordered them to return to their houses. This act was withheld without a precedent, but the contingent troops were compelled to withdraw and we were assailed in the most vulnerable part of our frontiers. Prince Schwarzenberg was commander-in-chief of the Allied armies. He had brought with him the greater part of the troops belonging to the princes of the late Confederation of the Rhine. In order to render them more available than they had there to prove, this numerous army broke up from the plains of Friedling in front of Hooningen and arrived at the edge of the bridge Baal at an early hour on the 20th or 21st of December at the very moment when the emperor was repairing to the legislative body in the French capital. The Swiss had not destroyed the bridge Baal, but merely removed the planks without throwing any of the beams into the river so that the bridge could be repaired in the space of two hours as the event actually proved. Prince Schwarzenberg presented himself at the entrance of the bridge on the right bank and demanded a passage across the name of the Allied Sovereigns. He summoned the Swiss to repair their bridge under pain of having their town set on fire. His orders were complied with. The planks were replaced and a free passage allowed and bow be held during eight successive days. This countless number of troops penetrating through its territory on their way to spread desolation in France, setting forth at the same time that they were actuated by principles of moderation and humanity. A 
portion of the Allied army consisting of Austrians passed through Switzerland with an intention of debauching by Geneva and arrived before that town on the very day when the brave general who commanded the garrison had been attacked with an apoplectic fit. It had only 1,500 equipped soldiers, mostly veterans, to defend it. The population was numerous and foremost amongst those who placed confidence in the language of the enemy so that the garrison was under the necessity of overawing the inhabitants who were too well inclined to throw open their gates. The evil disposed people of Geneva were fully sensible of its weakness. They did not remain inactive, but exerted all their endeavors to persuade the officer who had succeeded his general in the command of the garrison to accept of a capitulation which would allow him to retire from the town with all the honors of war. The civil authorities had already withdrawn. The officer gave way, and the frontier was thrown back in that direction as far as Fort Lecluse. The Emperor Alexander, on his part, first established his headquarters at Ball and pushed forward a corps into Alsace, composed of the Bavarian troops, who testified their gratitude towards us by reopening the wounds we had received in defending their independence. The Bavarian corps was commanded by General Vreda, the Bavarian officer whom the emperor had marked out, amongst others, as the object of his special regard. He had presented him with an estate producing an income of 30,000 livres, which fell to his disposal in consequence of the Treaty of Peace of 1809 and had the advantage of being situated in that portion of the Austrian territory assigned over to Bavaria. On that occasion, Vreda was one of those men with whose characters the emperor had been more particularly pleased. He always delighted in the company of that officer, and in being of service to him, the Bavarian corps summoned the town of Huningen, which rejected every proposal. The enemy blockaded it and pushed forward a reconnoitering party as far as Colmar, whilst their main army was penetrating into France by Altkirk, before and Vesul, before had but a weak garrison to make up for this defect. Its population had a very martial character, and it made a brilliant and vigorous defense. The hostile army advanced from Vistul to Langren and waited in the latter position until the Prussian army, which had crossed the Rhine above Mentz at Oppenheim, Worms, Mannheim, and below it from being in two Koblenz, should have collected and have reached the Moselle and until the communication had been open with it previously to making any forward movement. The Prussian army, which was marching under the orders of General Blücher, advanced by Kaiser Slautern, Staubruck, Chateau Ceylon, and saint avold leaving Mentz on its right. It proceeded by way of Vic in the direction of Nancy, Pont a Mousson and Toul. On reaching this position, the hostile armies were in line, but they would never have dared to effect that movement through so many fortified places if the emperor had been possessed of one third of their numbers and wielded in such a manner as to assume at once the offensive by throwing himself in the midst of these fortified towns. Had fortune kept that resource in reserve for him, we should then have beheld the extinction of many military renowns and that triumvirate of eagles which came to prey upon the French eagle would have been driven back in all the directions in which it had penetrated into French territory. There is no doubt that the emperor might have had such an army at his command if negotiations with Spain had been carried on with that activity so imperiously called for by the crisis which had given rise to them. There was yet sufficient time left to conclude them. And to bring up our troops, it will presently be seen why this last plank of safety was not made available. On receiving the news of the simultaneous invasion of the French territory at so many different points, the Emperor's firmness of mind did not forsake him. I am two months behindhand, he said. Had I that time a command, they should not have crossed the Rhine. This may be attended with serious consequences, but I can do nothing single-handed unless I am assisted. I must fall in this struggle. It will then be seen whether the aggression is directed against me personally. Great activity was displayed on every side. No effort was neglected. Everything, however, was left unfinished. The invasion struck a general panic. This was not all. Besides the moral effect which it produced, it had the further inconvenience of depriving us of the many resources that might have been derived from the warlike populations of the provinces of Alsace, Franche-Comte, and Lorraine. 
This was the greatest evil and the most severely felt. The utmost tranquility reigned in France. Not the slightest spark of agitation could be discovered. The people suffered with perfect resignation. They longed for the termination of such heavy calamities. But no one attempted to create a disturbance. The emperor was pleased at this internal state of things, but he found that his battalions did not augment their numerical strength and that the enemy was still advancing. He ordered that the troops which were retreating by the two roads at Metz and Strasbourg should assemble at chalon sur marne and he sent off at the same time the Imperial Guard in the direction of R.C. sur Albe. The theater of operations had not yet acquired that interest and importance which came to possess in the months of February and March following. The emperor was placed in a very extraordinary position. He had sufficient troops in the fortified towns of Germany, which were still in his possession, wherewith to form a powerful army. He had other troops in some of the fortresses of Holland and Belgium. And ever since the invasion of that territory, most of the towns of the old frontier had received garrisons to defend them. Independently of 8,000 men in Antwerp, there were 10,000 men in Vessel, and 12 or 15,000 at Metz. In Italy, moreover, there was an army, but hardly strong enough to defend itself in case of an attack. Rome was occupied by a small corps. Another protected Florence. The two corps were fighting on the frontiers of Spain, the one in Roussillon and the other under the walls of Bayonne. Lastly, the emperor, with an inconsiderable army, was protecting Paris from the attacks of the whole of Europe, and each of his movements told with powerful effect. None but the first sovereigns of Europe could have under arms as many troops as the emperor had still at his command, those scattered about in the several directions I have named. Had it been possible for him to assume the offensive at an earlier moment, he would have caused the garrison to join him one after the other in regular succession, with the exception of those which were so far removed that they no longer took any part in the war. It is much to be deplored that a hero who was struggling with so much courage against misfortunes should not have been better seconded. It had become habitual, as I have already stated, to depend upon the emperor's attending to and directing every branch of the service. He had in some measure encouraged everyone in this inattention. The consequence was that all duties were performed mechanically as they extended no farther than the literal execution of his orders. A task so less arduous, as he called for no stretch of combination of mind, nothing beyond a really and strict compliance. If the emperor had been aided by anyone competent to rise to the height of his conceptions, all the troops at his command in the fortresses beyond the Rhine would have been set in motion as far back as the month of December when the Allied army was approaching Switzerland. This would have been a natural consequence of the principle that the garrisons of fortified towns are destined to keep an enemy's army in check after the loss of a battle or to favor any movement of the army intended for their relief. It was reasonable to suppose that the garrison of all those places would have been collected together, and had this been done, they would have presented a mass sufficient to attract the attention of the hostile army and compel it to act with more circumspection, since it had not shown any apprehension in the fortified places in their isolated character, and had left them in its rear. The Minister of War would not have forgotten that he had, since the loss of the Battle of Leipzig, delivered important letters to my care for March Davout at Hamburg, and that I had succeeded in forwarding them through England to their destination. It needed no effort of genius to determine what ought to have been done for the service of the Emperor of France in the present emergency. It would have been sufficient to bear in mind that this prince had, in 1806, moved from the borders of the mine to the odor in less than two months, that after compelling the whole Prussian army to capitulate in the open field, he had arrived beyond the Vistula before the expiration of the third month of the campaign, dating from the time of his departure from Metz. It was possible, therefore, for their troops upon the Oder and the Elba to reach the Rhine during the months of December, January, and February. The line of communications was not so much obstructed as to prevent adoption of this course. It is for those who neglected it to explain their reasons, I can assert that it was so much the emperor's intention to command such a movement that he was under the impression of having issued instructions to that effect and did me the honor to write me word that his orders were no longer obeyed. It was only after the receipt of this letter that the Duke of Feltra sent me a few paper balls to forward to the commanders of all the garrisons shut up in the fortified towns 
These were orders written upon such small slips that when rolled up, they were not larger than a bee. I was guilty of the indiscretion of opening one of them, which only contained these words, Monsieur le Général. The Emperor complains that you do not give the enemy sufficient employment. I must acknowledge I was deeply mortified that nothing more should have been written to general officers whose services might have been so much, so important to the cause. Chapter 26. Notwithstanding such acts of oversight and neglect, the Allied army with the three principal sovereigns of Europe at its head made its approaches the utmost circumspection, so apprehensive was it that some unforeseen maneuver might on a sudden spread disorganization among his columns. The emperor remained another month in Paris, where he had exchanged places with the chiefs of the coalition. He would unquestionably have arrived in a fortnight. During this interval, he husbanded all the resources upon which he could rely and sent off the Duke of Vincenza to the headquarters of the Emperor Alexander Rather with the view of gratifying the impatience of those who were of the opinion and entirely rested with him to make peace. Then, with any expectation that the Duke would succeed in opening Pacific negotiations, he gave me such instructions as to note at once the desire he felt to terminate a disastrous war and the fixed determination rather to descend from the throne than to subscribe to a disgraceful peace. Those instructions were as follows. I have great doubts of the good faith of the Allies and of England. Being desirous of peace, I am anxious for it, but it must be a solid and an honorable one. France, without her natural limits, without a stand in Antwerp, would no longer be in harmony with the other powers of Europe. They, as well as England, have all admitted those limits of Frankfurt. The conquest beyond the Rhine cannot compensate for the acquisitions made by Austria, Russia, and Prussia in Poland and in Finland, or the English encroachment in Asia. The conduct of Austria will be influenced by the policy of England and the hatred of the Emperor of Russia. I have accepted the basis of Frankfurt. But it is probable that the Allies will no longer have the same views. Their proposals have been nothing more than a mark to disguise them. When the system is adopted of allowing the negotiations to be influenced by military events, it is impossible to foresee its consequences. You must listen to and observe everything. It's not quite certain that you may be received at headquarters. The Russians and the English will endeavor to obstruct every means of offering explanations to and of conciliating the Emperor of Austria. You must endeavor to ascertain the views of the Allies and make me a daily report of what you may learn so as to enable me to give you fresh instructions which I should be at a loss to establish upon any basis. At the present moment, is there any intention of confining France within her old limits? This would be degrading her. It is a mistake to suppose that the evils of war can make a nation desirous of such a peace. There is not a French heart that would not feel the disgrace of it before six months had expired and reproach any government that could be so dastardly as to affix its signature to it. Italy is not untouched. The Viceroy commands a fine army. Before the lapse of a week, I shall have collected forces sufficient to fight many battles. Even before the arrival of my troops from Spain, the desolations caused by the Cossacks will have the effect of arming the inhabitants and of doubling our forces. If if I should be seconded by the nation, the enemy are hastening to their own ruin. If fortune should betray me, my determination is already formed. I am not wedded to the throne. I will neither disgrace the nation or myself by subscribing dishonorable conditions. We must know what our Monsieur de Metternich's demands. It is not the interest of Austria to drive matters to extremity. The next step she takes, she ceases to act the first part in the state of things. I can give you no instructions. Confine yourself for their present to listening to and reporting everything. I'm almost to proceed to the army. You will be so near at hand that your first reports will occasion no delay in the further progress of affairs. Send frequent couriers to me. Napoleon, Paris, 4th January, 1814. The emperor was not mistaken. The allies wished for nothing more than a semblance of negotiations. The Duke of Vicenza was refused admittance. He stopped at Lunaville, where the hostile forces were stationed, opened a communication with Metternich and urged in vain to be allowed to proceed. The reason alleged was that the affairs ought to follow their usual course. Great stress was laid upon the necessity of a right understanding of holding a consultation, and the French plenipotentiary was allowed to waste his time to no purpose for the space of 16 days in the town of Lunaville. Nevertheless, the Emperor of Austria continued to correspond with Maria Luisa, assuring her of his tenderness and of his determination, whatever might be the turn of events, never to separate the cause of his daughter and grandson from that of France. 
as this may possibly bear allusion to some projects of other powers in favor of the Bourbons. The emperor directed the Duke of Vicenza to hold a confidential intercourse with Metternich and again remind him of their views and considerations which ought to guide him in the discussion of the great interests confided to his care. France was to preserve her natural limits. This condition was a sine qua non. All the powers of Europe, he continued, including England, had acknowledged those bases at Frankfurt. France, once reduced to her old limits, would not now possess two-thirds of the relative power she possessed 20 years back. What she has acquired towards the Alps and the Rhine does not compensate for what Russia, Austria, and Prussia have acquired by the mere acts of the partition of Poland. All those powers have aggrandized themselves to pretend to bring France back to her former state would be to lower and degrade her. France would be nothing without the departments of the Rhine, without Belgium, Austin, and Antwerp. The system of reducing France to her old limits is inseparably connected with the restoration of the Bourbons because they alone could offer a guarantee for the maintenance of that system. And England was fully aware of the fact. With anyone else, peace on such a basis would be impossible or could never last. Neither the emperor nor the republic of it should spring anew from this state of agitation could ever subscribe such a condition. As to what concerns his majesty, he has taken his determination, which nothing can affect. Could he consent to leave France less powerful than he found her? If therefore the allies should pretend to alter the basis already except accepted and proposed the former limits. The emperor has only the choice of three courses, either to fight and conquer, to die honorably in the struggle, or lastly, to abdicate if the nation should not support him. The throne had no charms for him. He would never attempt to purchase it at the price of dishonor. The English might be desirous of depriving him of Antwerp, but this would not be in the interest of the continent, as the peace founded upon such a basis would not last three years.